back in the house of the Lord. Maybe I got time. Maybe not. <laughs> How many of you can say there will be no sound systems in heaven? Are we getting there? Yeah, maybe. No? I hear something. Well, this morning we were talking about um, David, a great man of courage. And uh, we just had a great time together. The Lord really blessed us. And um, I'm looking for no other than that tonight. And um, we left off talking about um, how David at one time in his life had um, done some great and awesome things. And um, he had killed Goliath, the Philistine, if you remember that. Huh? Say amen. Amen. And that uh, at the time he killed the Philistine, he had not, I mean, he was not a man of war. Uh, he just went and to carry Abinadab, his brother, and Shammah, his brother, some food, some cheeses, and check on things, see how it was going. And when he got there, they told him, they said, you're just a youth, you're supposed to be back home. Uh, there's no place for you. This is no place for you. We're at war. Strangely enough, there hadn't been a shot fired, or in that case, an arrow thrown. It was just taunting at that time. And um, I also find it quite amazing that the very ones that said that to him, they were present a number of years or, or months ago when the prophet Samuel came to anoint David to be the next king, although Israel didn't know about it yet. I believe it was five years or so after he had been anointed king at his house in Bethlehem before he was actually coronated king at Hebron. So that sort of gives you an idea of where we were at uh, with this man of courage. And I told you this morning, and again my, my goal would be that you would walk away with courage today. Courage to let go of the past. Courage to let go of whatever holds you back. If that means hurts, rejections, disappointments, disillusionment, failure, abuse, whatever it is. And that you'd also gain the courage to try again. To reach out and to reach up and have faith. Faith is that, um, uh, that makes us believe that we can. Faith is the substance of what we hope for and the evidence of what we don't yet see. I'm hoping that by the time I'm done that you'll have courage to hope again and to believe. Courage to say yes to the things that you should say yes to and no to the things that you should say no to. And this morning I mentioned courage to lead if you're a leader. Obviously everyone's not a leader and that's not a bad thing because who would leaders lead if there were no followers? But that we would have the courage to be a good follower. A courage to stand behind Someone and say, this is who God has put as a mentor before me or whatever it may be. It may be on your job. It may be at your church. I remember Brother Ken Smith calling me um, from Michigan. He and I have known each other for a number of years. He had been in Michigan, had done associate pastor, uh, youth pastor work, had, uh, had gone on to be a senior pastor of a church and uh, knew what it was like to uh, struggle and try to fix a, uh, a real tough situation up there. And uh, God had blessed him, but when the, he later merged his church with another church, and uh, anyway, he called me one day and said, if it's the Lord's will, I'm ready to come home, if it's the Lord's will. And here's what he said. He said, he's been the senior pastor, he said, but I don't have to be. He said, I'm totally content working under your ministry and working alongside and supporting you in whatever role God would have it to be. And uh, I remember that conversation like it was yesterday to, uh, to do whatever talents I have, whatever gifts I have. What I'm simply saying, is Brother Ken a leader? Yes, he is. Don't get me wrong. But uh, we have people in leadership and we have people in fellowship. And the one thing is you can never be a great leader until you've been a great follower. And you say Amen. So I pray that you have the courage to lead if you're a leader, the courage to follow and stand beside someone. So, and, and I want to move on now to part two of this message. I told you that you would get in a place where, uh, man, you're really blessed. And David was. He went to the battlefield. He, 
He assessed the situation. He talked to the king. He got permission. I want to bring out one highlight from this morning's message before we move on. David talked to Saul, and Saul basically says, you know, you can't do this. You're too young. And he says, well, look, I've got some good memories of killing a bear and a lion. I was watching my daddy's sheep. He said, and, and now this Philistine has come. He's uncircumcised, in which that's our first clue to let us know that David was not looking at how big the man was. He was simply saying he's not in covenant relationship with God. Circumcision was a sign of the Abrahamic covenant. And he's saying that he's not serving the same God we're serving. So I don't care how big he is, God's going to give me the victory. Can you say amen? So that being said, um, Saul then gave him his gear, his armor, his sword. And David put it on and it was cumbersome. And it was, it was, uh, it, he just had not, he said, I haven't proven it. What he's saying is, is I'm not used to, to using it. Like, it's like hunting with someone else's gun. Um, or, or, or doing, you know, driving someone else's motorcycle. Or he, he said, I just, I'm not used to it. I'm not good. I, I, I just got to do it my way. Now, what David was saying is, I'm not doing it David's way. I'm doing it God's way. And so I brought out a highlight. This, or I bring this highlight back to you to say that, you know, when he looked at Saul and said, you know what, I know that's the way you fight. I know that's the way your men fight. But I just can't do it that way. And by the way, and I don't think he said this because he wasn't a smart aleck, I don't believe, in my studies. There wasn't any other man in the camp that was volunteering to go fight this nine foot six giant. Are y'all hearing me? No one else was there to sign on to do what David said he would do. And David said, I just can't take this. And I, I, I said that to say this, that there are times, and, and we're raising a wonderful generation of young people right now. We've got a kid's crusade coming up. It's going to be off the chain if I can use some of their language. And, and it, it's going to be fun, and it's going to be moving. It's going to touch their lives. But we've got to realize someone, I, I could just hear someone saying, well, what in the world has a superhero got to be in the church for? I serve one. His name is Jesus. If our children can learn all the names of the superheroes, they ought to be able to learn all the disciples. If they can learn all the names of that, come on, give the Lord praise. So, so um, that's what we talked about. But then, and, and I, I'll get back to some of that later, but David killed Goliath. He held his head up, you know, and he cut his head off with Goliath's own sword. It was very prophetic because David said, look, you've come to me with a sword and a spear. He, he said, but I have come to you in the name of the Lord. That is the chief difference. David said, I'm coming to own business for Yahweh. Business for God. Amen. And I understand who I am, and I'm nowhere near as big as you. But I know who I've been with. Amen. I know who I've got a relationship with. So I'm telling you, friend, it takes courage to walk out there. Can you say amen? It takes courage to walk out there and fight this guy. And David said, well, I'm the man to do it. I, I'm, you know, at some point you've got to say, hey, if I win, I win. If I lose, I lose. Just like the three Hebrew boys said to King Nebuchadnezzar, look, king, we're not even careful to answer you concerning this matter. God will deliver us from your hand. Here they go. But if so be... If he don't, he has delivered us from you. <laughs> Amen? So one way or the other, he said, that takes courage. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about David, this great man of courage. And um, in his early life, um, the, uh, the prophet Samuel, who was literally priest, prophet, and judge of Israel for a great period of time, Samuel's the one who come to anoint David king. If you remember, he had anointed Saul king. And then Saul walked away from God. And Samuel prayed for him, man. He prayed for him, and he prayed for him, and Saul wouldn't change. He basically backslidden. Y'all with me? Say amen. And I'm going to tell you why. Here, here's how I know. In fact, the Lord spoke to Samuel one day. He was praying and wailing and crying about Saul. And the Lord says, Samuel, Samuel, how long will you weep for Saul? How long will you mourn for him? I have rejected him from serving my people. And guess what? I've got a man after my own heart. His name is David. Take you a hen of oil and go to the house of Jesse the Bethlehemite. I want you to anoint someone. So this is his early life. Uh, he's um, showing great courage in what he's doing in his young life. That is, he's protecting his father's sheep. I want you to know that being a shepherd was a low job. 
It was really degrading. It was nothing to write home about. Can you say amen? I'm telling you, the greatest leaders come from nothing. And Billy Graham was one. Are y'all hearing me? Different, different men and women in life that really thought they were nothing, that, that came from nothing, of no reputation. Huh? God raises him up to be great stalwarts in the kingdom of God. So this great shepherd, here he is out in the Judean hills. He's watching his daddy's flock, and Samuel comes to anoint with oil, and, you know, they bring out all of the guys, Eliab and Abinadab and uh, uh, Shammah and different ones, and, and they, he says, is that all your boys? I believe seven walked by him. He said, well, we've got one more, but surely it ain't him. He's the least. He's, um, he's a shepherd. Samuel gave a word and said, everybody stand up. Jesse, would you send somebody to get him? The rest of us will stand until he gets here. <laughs> Isn't that neat? And I want to show you, here's a gold nugget for you. What you're doing, while you're thinking you're doing nothing, you're out in the middle, you know, you're, you're serving uh, in the fields, it's cold, it's wet, it's rainy, it's hot, it's dry, it's musty, all these things. But while he's there, he's blessing the Lord with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. He's writing some of his best works right there in the Judean hills. Are you with me? And one day, all of a sudden, someone comes and says, David, come on, somebody's asked about you. He gets to the house, and all of a sudden he goes uh, from worst to first. Isn't that something? All of a sudden he gets a promotion, and, and you know he walks in the house. He don't even know what's going on. Time he walks through the door, something hits his head. Gloom, 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 gloom. Oil flowing all over his head, down him. And the Bible said, as the oil ran over him, the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and rested upon David. Are you hearing me? And the Holy Spirit anointing come upon him to lead God's people to the greatest dynasty that ever was um, in his day. So that, that's his early life. He was divinely chosen as king of Israel. It is not an accident that, that his daddy would send him out to check on the troops. That was a divine appointment for him to kill Goliath that day. Now, I want you to understand some things now. He's serving under Saul, and he literally become the, the king's harpist. I don't have a lot of time because I want to I talk to you about his later life um, in, in a moment. But, but King Saul, he, he's, I, I told you, he's backsliding. He's um, perhaps backslidden, and he's having evil dreams. He's having terrible things take place at night, so he calls for David. You know why he knows David knows how to play the harp? I bet you a many a day he sat out in the Judean hills, the sun was setting, and played that harp and wrote his songs. Amen? And the Bible said as he would play and as he would minister, the evil spirit would depart from him. Let me tell you, there's something about music, friend. You can sit there blowed up like a bullfrog while we're singing all you want to. But let me tell you something. If you'll get in the Spirit of the Lord and begin to sing the songs of Zion, amen? It's like light. When light comes in the room, darkness has got to get out. Amen. And uh, uh, David played, and, and the evil spirit would leave him. And I'm reminded of, you, you remember the great prophet of the Lord, Elisha, uh, when he went to, to the valley there, and he saw Jehoshaphat, and uh, they, they needed some water. And he, you know what he said? The very first thing he said, he said, bring me a minstrel. Bring me a musician that knows how to play. He wouldn't prophesy a word. He wouldn't say a word. He said, but bring me a musician. He said, and as the musician played, they called him a minstrel. He, as the minstrel played, then the Spirit of the Lord moved on Elisha, and he prophesied and said, make this valley full of ditches. You need rain, but you will never see the rain. He said, it'll rain on yonder mountain, way over there. You're not going to see lightning flashing or thunder or any of that. He said, but it's going to rain way over there, and it's going to run down the, 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 the mountain and careen into this valley. You better prepare yourself, he said, and make the valley full of ditches or the rain will pass right on by you. The power of music. Can you say amen? But let me go on. So David done that. And he remained at the court from time to time. He would go back and forth from the farm to the palace. And the king would call for him and he would bring his harp and he would come and he would play for the king. Huh? And then he'd go back to farm. He would be doing his shepherd duties. Now, he's already been anointed king. He could have got up and said, Hey, God's already said I'm king. I'm the king. No, he didn't do that. 
Nope. He went back to his shepherd duties, and he would come back when he was called for. He would go back to his shepherd duties. He would come back when he was called for. Let me say this. You don't have to make a way for yourself. God will make a way for you. When God has called you, God will make a way. Can you say amen? He then appears as champion for Israel. He kills Goliath. We talked about that this morning. This heroic feat wins the admiration of Jonathan, the son of Saul. And they become almost like brothers, knit together. And uh, um, David is... uh, Uh, Soon he's compelled to flee for his life because of some things that is happening. Um, Notice with me, if you will, 1 Samuel 18, 1 through 9. And in 1 Samuel 18, 1 through 9, he said, Now David had finished speaking to Saul. The soul of Jonathan was knit. This is after he killed Goliath. Was knit with him. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Saul took him that day and would not let him go home to his father's house anymore. In other words, you can't go back home now to the farm. I want you here in the palace. Now, oh, how things changed, though. Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. Verse 4, he said, And Jonathan took off the robe that was on him, and he gave it to David with his armor, and even the sword, and his bow, and his belt. So David went, and wherever Saul had sent him, and he behaved wisely, and Saul set him over the men of war, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people, and also uh, in the sight of Saul's servants. See, he set him over all of his men of war. Why, what greater warrior do you have, right? Now it happened as they were coming home. Watch this. Now here's the trouble. When David was returning from the slaughter of the Philistine, that the women had come out of the cities of Israel singing and uh, dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with joy, and with musical instruments... So the women sang as they danced and said, Saul hath slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. What's this? Then Saul was very angry. We're talking about a man that he's just now made captain. Uh, you know, he's, he's just now made him over all of his military might. We're talking about a man that he loved, a man that cheered, uh, that, that he cheered for. But he said Saul was very angry. And they dis, they, the saying displeased him and they said, They have described, or rather ascribed to David thousands, and to me they have ascribed only, or to David ten thousands, and to me only thousands. Now what more could he have but the kingdom? Verse 9, so they eyed, so Saul eyed David from that day forward. Now, we're, we're finding trouble here in paradise. Can you say amen? We're in a situation now. I want us to look over, um, to, um, 1 Samuel 19, uh, in this area, we're going to find now that David has reached uh, a zenith in his life, a real high point, if you will, this, this, this peak where he killed Goliath and everybody loved him because he's a national hero. And then because of jealousy, he now is declining, not in the eyes of the people, but in the eyes of the powers that be. And now he becomes a fugitive um, from, it's not really justice, but from the anger of the king. It's a dark period in his career. He's pursued by King Saul. Notice with me in chapter 19 of 1 Samuel. He says, uh, now Saul spoke to Jonathan, his son, and said, tell his servants that they should kill David. But Jonathan said, Saul's son delighted greatly in David. So Jonathan said to David, My father Saul seeks to kill you. Therefore, please be on your guard until morning. Stay in a secret place and hide. And and I will go out and stand beside my father in the field and where you are, and I will speak with my father about you. And then what I observe, I will tell you. Thus Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father. He said to him, Let not thy king sin against his servant, against David, because he's not sinned against you, and because his works have been very good towards you. Hey, can I tell you, you don't have to do anything bad for somebody to kill you. Or want to kill you. But thank God for friends like Jonathan that says, you know what? I'm on your side and I'm going to follow you. Now, now this is a defiance of the law. Did you know? Because usually about 99% of the time blood is thicker than water. And I don't care what. Family's going to stick with family. That's just how it is. I've seen it too many times. But Jonathan loved David, and I really think he loved the God that David served. But for he took his life in his hands, and he killed the Philistine. So so Jonathan's telling his dad, he said, look, David took his own life in his own hands, and he killed the Philistine. He said, and the Lord brought about a great deliverance for all of Israel, and you saw it and rejoiced. Why then will you sin against innocent blood to kill David without a cause? 
So Saul heeded the voice of Jonathan, and Saul swore, as the Lord lives, he shall not be killed. But, uh, just hang with me right there. We'll, uh, uh, you're going to find, if you study his life, that as time went on, David, uh, for whatever reason, he, Saul couldn't get it out of his crawl. He wanted to kill him. He could not deal with the jealousy that others were, uh, other people had things or ascribed to him things. Um, and so now he, he enters a dark spot in his life. I wish I had time to read it all. You go home, you can read 19, 20, 21, 22, and uh, I, I'm going to get over to 24 in just a moment. But I want to tell you what's happened. In several times, David is talking with, with Saul, and Saul would stash a javelin over by his seat, and then being mad, he would just grab that javelin, and, and in a moment's time, he would throw that javelin at David, trying to pin him to the wall. David's done nothing wrong. David had served the man that was trying to kill him. David had spared his life and the throne, so to speak. But, but he was not appreciated because of this jealousy. And now we have this terrible situation that has happened. Uh, he is now being pursued. He gave his word to Jonathan. Saul said to Jonathan, that, you know, Jonathan called David and Jonathan told him all the things. So Jonathan brought David to Saul and he was in his presence as in times past. And, and there was war again. David went out and he fought with the Philistines. He struck them down with a mighty blow. And they fled from him. And now the distressing spirit from the Lord came upon Saul as he sat in his house with his spear in his hand. And David was playing with music with his hand. And Saul sought uh, to pin David to the wall with a spear. But he slipped away from Saul's presence and he drove the spear into the wall. So David fled and escaped in the night. Now, I don't have time to read all of this. But, but this happens again and again. That Saul is out to kill him. And for no good reason. He did not deserve to die. Hadn't done anything to die. Now, I want to tell you something. It's easy to have courage once you're on top and everything's good to go. It's another thing to have courage when you're on the dark side of life. And we're entering a dark era in David's life. It is David as a fugitive. I want you to notice with me, if you will, in 1 Samuel 24... Uh, verses 1, we'll start there and just keep going for a little ways. But I want to show you something. It takes courage to keep yourself under control. Can you say amen? Because I know me. And I know how the old flesh is willing to get back. And the old flesh, don't look at me that way because your old flesh is willing to get even too if you have a chance. That's part of this humanity. But I, I want to show it to you, if I may. So let's look here in 24, 1 through 15. Now, it happened when Saul returned from following the Philistines. Guess, what? Guess who he's serving? Saul. That it was told him, saying that, take note, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. I'm sorry, Saul was... Back up one more time. Let me make sure I got that right. It happened when Saul had returned from following the Philistines. Okay, Saul, I was thinking it was David there. It was told him, take note that David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Okay, David right now is a fugitive. He has left the palace. He's running from Saul. Are you with me? You know why? I wouldn't stay there either. If I had to be doing all of this at dinner, you know, ducking and, you know, wondering what's been put in my food and all of this. So Saul took 3,000 chosen men from Israel. Hey now, hmm. 3,000 after David, that's, that's, that's quite a many. Now David probably had some followers, I'm sure he did. And he went back to seek David and his men on the rocks of the wild goats. So he came to the sheepfolds by the road where there was a cave and Saul went in to attend to his needs. David and his men were staying in the recesses of the cave. Then the men of David said to him, this is the day, watch this, this is very powerful and yet tricky. This is the day which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will deliver your enemy into your hand. Now this is David's men telling him, Look, the day has come. The day that the Lord, just like the Lord said, He would deliver the enemy. The, the, the Lord will deliver your enemy into your hand that you may do to him as it seems good to you. And David arose... 
and secretly cut off the corner of Saul's robe. I want you to notice something. Now, David, his men find Saul over in the cave, and Saul is asleep. David gets over there. Saul is sound asleep. His men are asleep. And he secretly and very quietly takes a, a knife and cuts off a piece of Saul's clothes. Are you with me? And now it happened afterward that David's heart was troubled. I, I don't get it. Do y'all? What's this? David's heart was troubled because he had cut Saul's robe. Saul wanted to cut his heart out. He wanted to take his life from him. Can I tell you, it takes courage when there lies your enemy asleep. I could drive him into the ground right now. And then you got cheerleaders saying, hey, God has given him to you. Go for it. There he is. Kill him now. It takes courage to obey the Lord and courage to follow your heart. Watch this. Then he said to the men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master. The Lord's anointed. What, what David realized and the way David handled this was that although Saul is not serving God now, and although Saul is trying to kill me for no reason, He's doing it because he's jealous that God placed his hand on me because he wouldn't serve him anymore. If he would have stayed right serving God, he'd still be king of Israel. Well, he was. Are y'all following me? But, but David said, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing and stretch out my hand against him, the Lord's anointed, seeing that he is the anointed of the Lord. So David restrained his servants. And while Saul lay there, they wanted to overtake him. They wanted to kill him. David said, don't touch him. And then David's heart was, was hurting because he had even cut off a piece of his clothes. Watch this. David restrained his servants with these words and did not allow them to rise against Saul. And Saul got up from the cave and he went on his way. David also arose afterward. And he went out of the cave and called Saul, saying, My Lord, the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David stooped with his face to the earth. Watch this. And he bowed down. Now here you are bowing down to a man who's been trying to kill you. Boy, does that take courage or what? Huh? David said to Saul, Why do you listen to the words of the men who say that indeed David seeks your life? See, I want to tell you something. When you get out of the place with God where you ought to be, you'll start believing junk that's not true. You'll start listening to people that don't have your best interest at heart. And Saul was not serving God as he, as he ought to. And there's men telling him that David's trying to kill him. And all David wanted to do was help him. All David wanted to do was to be the, the humble servant of the Lord. Look, this day, he says, your eyes have seen that what? The who? The Lord. You see, David told us, he told Saul, it wasn't David that killed the lion or the bear. It was the Lord that empowered me to do it. And that, that's why this Philistine that has come against us, he said, it's not so much as a nine foot six great big old man. I'm not worried about that. He said, it's the fact that he is a Philistine. He does not serve the Lord God that we serve. And he has defied our God. And I'm going to fight. And God's going to help me. And I'm going to take his head. And he done that. But David said, look, this day your eyes have seen that the Lord delivered you today into my hands. The Lord delivered you into my hands, he says, today. And someone urged me to kill you, but my eye spared you. And I said, I will not stretch out my hand against my Lord. Here he is, a man trying to kill him, and David still calls him Lord. That puts it in a different perspective, don't it? I won't raise my hand against my Lord, for He is the Lord's anointed. Wow. Moreover, my Father, see? Y'all don't get it? Huh? You see that? Not only does He call Him Lord, He calls Him Father. He says, 
Moreover, my father, see, yes, see the corner of your robe. It's in my hand. Look at, look at your robe. He says, for in that I cut the corner of your robe, and I did not kill you. No, and see that there is neither evil nor rebellion in my hand, and I have not sinned against you, yet you hunt my life to take it. Let the Lord judge between you and me, and let the Lord avenge me on you, but my hand shall not be against you. David had made his mind up that I am not going to touch you. If you die, it'll be because the Lord allowed you to die or the Lord killed you. But as far as David, David knew he would ascend the throne, that David would be the next king. He said, and you know what kings did? A lot of times in those days, when a king comes to power, everybody else in the former dynasty went down. That's right, every one of them died. But David says, if God kills you, you'll be dead. But David won't kill you. Right? What? And as the proverb of the ancient says, wickedness proceeds from the wicked. But my hand shall not be against you. Verse 14, after whom has the king of Israel come out? Whom do you pursue? A dead dog? A flea? Uh, therefore let the Lord be the judge and judge between you and me and see and plead my cause and deliver me out of your hand. I'm going to tell you, it takes courage to speak those kind of words. Can you say amen? If you're in that situation, now I want you to look with me to chapter number 26 and, and, and verse 1. Chapter 26 and verse 1. Now the Ziphites came to Saul at Gibeah saying, is David not hiding in the hill of Hekelah, uh, opposite uh, Jeshimon? Then Saul arose and went down to the wilderness of Ziph, having 3,000 chosen men of Israel with him to seek David in the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul encamped uh, in the hill of Hekelah, which is opposite of Jeshimon, by the road. But David stayed in the wilderness, and he saw that Saul came after him into the wilderness. Now David therefore sent out spies and understood that Saul had indeed come. So David arose, and he came to the place where Saul had encamped. And David saw the place where Saul lay, and Abner, the son of uh, Ner. Now listen, Abner was basically a general for... Um, for Saul. So uh, much like Joab would later become for David. And David saw the place where Saul lay in Abner, the son of Ner, and the commander of his army. Now Saul lay within the camp with the people encamped all around about him. And then David answered and said to uh, Ahimelech the Hittite and to Abishai the son of Zeruah, uh, the brother of Joab, saying, Who will go down with me to Saul in the camp? And Abishai said, I will go down with you. And uh, David said to Abishai, I come and the people, uh, to the people by night. And there Saul lay sleeping with the camp with his spear stuck in the ground by his head. And Abner and the people lay all around, lay all around him. Then Abishai I said to David, watch this, here it is. Here's the temptation again. God has delivered your enemy into your hand this day. Now therefore, please, let me. In other words, you ain't got to do it, David. Abishai I says, let me strike him at once with a spear right to the earth, and I will not have to strike him the second time. See, Abishai, I say, look, David, I love you so much. I'm going to fight for you. And, and, um, and, and they say, hey, look, God has delivered you. Why is it that month after month you're running for your life and you hadn't done nothing wrong? And Saul calls a truce and he says, I'm not going to hunt you no more. But every time he turns around, he does it. And, and, and listen, David, if you don't kill him eventually, he's going to kill you. But again, if you're not careful when you get away from God, you'll start listening to things you ought not listen to and you'll start believing things that you ought not believe. So David said to Abishai, I do not destroy him for who can stretch out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless. Watch this. David had already said, I'm not going to touch him. And then David now says, and anybody under my command is not going to touch him. Not on my orders anyway. David said, furthermore, as the Lord lives... The Lord shall strike him, or his day shall come to die, or he shall go out to battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed, but please take now the spear and the jug of water that are by his head and let us go. 
David took the spear and the jug of water by Saul's head, and they got away. And no man saw or knew it or awoke. For they were all asleep because a deep sleep from the Lord had fallen on them. I want to tell you something about this thing working with God. God can cause people to sleep harder than they would normally sleep. God can cause people to hear things that are not there. God can cause armies to see things and hear things that are not there and are not making noise. God can fight for you, and God will fight for us. Now notice this, it, but he, I, what I'm saying is it takes courage to, to pursue Him and courage to be able to, and, and meekness, meekness is power under control, to hold yourself back, you see, because what many people would, would say you should do is kill Him. Come out with His head just like you did Goliath. Right? Please the people. And David says, no, I'd rather please God. So, now David went over to the other side and he stood on the top of the hill afar off, a great distance between them. And David called out to the people and to Abner, the son of Ner, saying, do you not answer, Abner? And then Abner answered and said, who are you calling out to the king? David said to Abner, are you not a man? And who is like you in Israel? Why then have you not guarded your Lord, the king? For one of the people came in to destroy your Lord, the king. This thing that you have done is not good. As the Lord lives, you deserve to die because you have not guarded your master, the Lord's anointed. And now see where the, see where the king's spear is and the jug of water that was by his head. Then Saul knew David's voice and said, Is that your voice? My son David, do you hear the hypocrisy? David said, it is my voice, my Lord, O king. And he said, why does my Lord thus pursue his servant? For what have I done, or what evil is in my hand? Now therefore, please let my Lord the king hear the words of his servant. If the Lord has stirred up against me, let him accept an offering. But if it is the children of men, may they be cursed before the Lord. For they have driven me out this day from the sharing in the inheritance of the Lord's uh, saying, Go serve other gods. So now do not let my blood fall to the earth before the face of the Lord. For the king of Israel has come out to seek a flea as when one hunts a partridge in the mountains. Now, here's what I want to say right here. What David is trying to do, the reason David pursued him, and some people don't understand it. Some people don't. Why is it that David went after him? I'm going to tell you because David had been chased and chased and chased. They had lied about him saying he was trying to take the throne. They had went on to say, you know, just, and it, and it started because of a simple song that Saul has slain his thousands, but David has slain his tens of thousands, and all of these things. And jealousy, did you know what the Bible says about jealousy? It is the rage of a man. Hmm? And, um, so Saul is jealous of him, and Saul pursues him and pursues him and tries to kill him time and time and time. I want to tell you something, though. Listen, you try to kill me all you want to, but if the Lord says it's not my time, it ain't happening, friend. You heard about the man that walked into John Hagee's church in San Antonio, Texas with a three fifty seven revolver, shot six times. Three bullets went into this side of the podium, and three went into this side. We're talking about from right there. We're not talking about way down the road somewhere. Huh? We're talking about documented stuff. It wasn't John Hagee's time to go. Hello? Nobody's aiming that bad. That's a big target. Huh? Right? It wasn't his time to go. And, and, and I'm telling you that when, when you're doing right and you're serving the Lord, people are going to say all kinds of things. They're going to talk about you if you're doing good. They're going to talk about you if you're doing bad. But Saul had pursued David and pursued David and pursued David. And finally David says, okay, I found out where you're at. And the only reason I'm coming out for you, I'm not coming to kill you. If I wanted to kill you, I could have killed you twice. He said, I could have killed you. Abishai, I could have killed you. Joab could have killed you. And for that, any man that I had with me, that we could have killed you if I wanted to kill you. And I've proven that I could have killed you because I've got a piece of garment from your robe. I personally cut your clothes while God had you in a deep sleep. Further letting him know he was no longer serving the God that he once served. And now not only have I got a piece of your clothes as evidence, 
I've got a jug of water and I've got your spear. How did I get this close to you? I'm telling you what is impossible with man is still possible with God. Huh? We're talking about a king that had a general with him at all times. We're talking about somebody that was his personal bodyguard that looked after him, that commanded his troops. And that's why David said to him, look here, brother. Abner deserves to die because he allowed me to get close enough to you to take his clothes, to take your clothes. He allowed me to get close enough to take your bottle of water and to take your spear. He ought to die. Listen, if anybody gets that close, that's a serious breach of security. David said, I could kill you if I wanted to kill you. But I'm not here to kill you. What David was saying was, I'm here to serve you. I'm here to serve you. I've called you Father. I've called you my Lord. Huh? I'm here to serve. I don't want... You know, you know, here's what I found. Most people don't want the throne. I know some of the greatest pastors I know they never set out to be no pastor. They said, I don't want a pastor. You know what? When I went into the ministry, being a lead pastor was never my goal. Never. In fact, I, in 1986 is when I went into the ministry. In 1987, I went through ministerial internship after um, getting licensed and so forth and started pursuing ordination and all of that. I stayed at my home church there for six years. Four of which I was in the military, and then I stayed two more. By then, God had blessed me. I went on staff as an associate pastor. I was Pastor Jesse Ogden's number two man, and completely happy and content to be so. I didn't desire to uh, to be no lead pastor of a church. I never signed up to be. But Brother C. E. Landreth, the state administrative bishop at that time, called me. And asked me to be in his office the next morning at 9 o'clock, or Tuesday at 9 o'clock. And, man, I was really distraught. I didn't really have no idea what he wanted. He wouldn't tell me on the phone. So, uh, but I got there and he said, are you still interested in pastoring? <laughs> I said, I've never expressed no interest in pastoring. He said, what? I said, no, sir, I've never expressed any interest because you know when you finished MIP you had some sort of a little dream sheet what would you want to do you want to evangelize pastor youth pastor associate pastor uh, senior ministers uh, uh, children you know on and on and on and I was doing associate pastor work and had no desire to do anything else other you know I didn't have to be senior pastor but anyway he talked to me about going to pastor in Claxton Georgia and the Lord really laid some things on my mind. I said, I'll tell you what, if I get the vote, I'll go. I did, and that's what started pastoral ministry. I'm simply saying I wasn't signing up for it. I didn't ask for it. David didn't ask to be king. David sat in the Judean hills doing what God had called him to do, serving his earthly father the best way he knew how to serve him. While he was there, he played his harp, he wrote his music, he done all of these things. And I'm going to tell you something. If you're serving God the way you ought to serve him, if you're just really seeking out God, I'm telling you, God's going to place you and put you in the place He needs you to be to be effective for Him. David was the greatest king to ever rule Israel. Huh? And did you know in the eternal kingdom He will sit right under Jesus? <laughs> Isn't that great? Would you stand with me tonight? And even having said that, David got in some trouble too, don't get me wrong. But one thing I can tell you about David. David always was quick to admit his guilt. When the prophet came to him and said to him, you know, he told him a little story about a man coming to town, taking someone's one little ewe lamb he had and slaughtering that one and, you know, and all this. And he was using that story as a parallel for David taking Uriah's wife, Bathsheba, and as soon as he finished telling the story, David pronounced judgment and said what would happen. Nathan looked at him and said, you're the man I'm talking about. You're the, you're the one in this story. David fell to his face in repentance right then. He wrote Psalm 51, the greatest story of repentance in all of Scripture. 
He took the blame. He accepted the responsibility. David loved God with all his heart. David was courageous. David wasn't scared. I told you this morning that he loved Saul's daughter, Michal, and he wanted to marry her, and Saul trying to kill him. He said, I'll tell you what, you can marry her if you bring me a hundred foreskins of the Philistines. He brought back two hundred. He was a man of courage. He was not, he was not afraid of anything. But I'm going to tell you, he was looking at it through different eyes. I want to, uh, let me qualify that remark. He was not afraid of anything that God wanted him to do. If God laid something on his heart, he would run full tilt and not even worry about it. He had courage beyond belief. But even David, he done some bad things. He, um, he had the affair with Bathsheba. He conspired and eventually killed Uriah the Hittite. Not personally, but he ordered it. He done some things that he shouldn't have done. And the Lord punished him by not allowing him to build the temple. He said, you're too much, you're a man of blood. And you know what, even God's ministers, they got to they pay the price too. Moses was allowed to see the promised land from Mount Pisgah, but never go in. He said, because you struck the rock twice when I told you to speak to it. Because of your disobedience and some of the things you've done, you can't never go. But you're going to lead the people to the edge. And then I'm going to ask you to bring your protege, that mentoree that you've been training. Bring Joshua back to the tent of meeting. And I'm going to take some of the spirit that rests on you, Moses. And you're going to lay your hand on Joshua. And he's going to finish what you started. He's going to lead them across into the promised land. And as for David, David continued to raise money. David continued to set aside millions of dollars. But it was Solomon who would build the temple. It was Solomon that would, in his young days, he prayed and said, Oh Lord, that I might know how to walk in and out among your people. That I might know how to be king. Not, not to have riches and not to have affluence and not all of that. And the Lord said, Because you have asked wisdom. And not riches and honor. I'm going to give you wisdom and riches and honor. And Solomon built the temple I want to say he slaughtered 22,000 ox, oxen that day and made a big sacrifice to the Lord. And the Bible said the holy presence of God came down in the house. So much that the place literally shook under the power of God. And Solomon is in the temple there and he's praying. As he's praying, uh, he just... You know, how many of you know, sometimes when the Holy Spirit gets on you and you're praying and... And you're in the house of God. You feel like David. I can run through a troop and I can leap over a wall. Man, sign me up. I can do anything. And then you get out of the church, away from that that spirit of the moment. You say, man, what did I say I'd do? Woo! I ain't so sure. And Solomon had one of them moments while he's at the altar. God was in the house. The smoke filled the place. They couldn't even see where to go, what to do. Solomon is there, the son of David, and he says, But Lord, what if there comes a time when your people sin? What if there comes a time and they don't burn for you like they are right now? What if there's a time where uh, they just don't serve you as they should? And the Lord spoke to him and he penned these words. Then if my people which are called by my name, would humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sins. I'll forgive their iniquities. I'll be their God. What he says, if they'll they'll just humble themselves again. and And I wasn't preaching about Solomon, but I just couldn't help but tell you what the son of David had to say. David was a great man of courage. Furthermore, I could have spent the whole series there, but furthermore, David, as you know, under uh, previous reigns, the Ark of the Covenant was gone. It was lost. It went to the Philistines. Huh? And David was the man of God, the king that went and got it back and brought the Ark of the Covenant home. And um, I'm just telling you, David was a man of courage. And you too, 
can be a man or a woman of courage. My heads are bowed and eyes are closed. It takes courage to do what is right. I just want to ask you tonight, if the Lord lays it on your heart, maybe, maybe you're in a situation and maybe you're just like David. You have, the Lord has given you your enemy and there they are. There, there's, there's your enemy. They've been after you and trying to kill you, wanted to kill you. And you've got every opportunity right now. And the old flesh rises up and says, finish the job, man. Be done with them. It's going to take courage to override what other people are saying do. For you to be able to say, you know what? David said, I'll let the Lord deal with them. I'll let the Lord mete out His justice and His mercy. I'll let the Lord decide what He's going to do, but David's not going to do it. It takes courage to do that, friend. It takes courage for you to say, you know what? I'm going to let go and let God. It takes courage to say, I'm not going to try to fix it. Because you know what? And especially leaders are guilty of this. If we see a situation and we feel like we can fix it, we're prone to jump in and try to fix it. And sometimes the Lord is just simply saying, let me work it out. I want to ask you tonight, can we just gather together as a group? We're talking about courage. I'm going to open these altars and I want everyone who wants courage to come. Some of you don't have the courage. You don't feel like you can do anything. You don't feel like you could stand to sing a song. You don't feel like you could stand to teach. You couldn't stand to read or anything. I want to give you an opportunity tonight. If you say, Pastor, I really would love to have the courage David had. Would you step out tonight? Lord, I want courage to do right in the face of wrong. I want courage to, to stand. I want courage to do what I ought to do instead of what I want to do. I want courage to do that. It takes courage to do that. David was a great man of courage. While heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If you're here tonight and you say, Pastor, I need courage of whatever it may be. Whatever reason it may be. Could you step out from where you are and just come with me to this altar? I need courage. Some of you need courage to stay in the relationship that you're in. Some of you need courage to deal with the problems at work. Some of you need courage to deal with um, whatever it may be. It could be a, your, your spouse. It could be a neighbor. It could be a child that's giving you problems. A parent. But you need courage. If you need courage, all you have to do is ask. Just like wisdom, when God gives wisdom to those who ask, He'll give courage to those who ask. So if you need courage, I ask you to come. If you need courage, I ask you to come. Consuming all for your son's holy name, and with the heavens we declare, You are our King.
a fire consuming all for your sons holy name and with the heavens we live you are our King we love you Raise your hands and say it with it, would you? You are. 
as it were in those days about the word of God and what what your word says that we might rehearse it in our own ears oh God I praise you for these icons of courage for Abigail for Joshua for David I tell you I, I, on the last Sunday of the month I'm going to preach a message about Jesus the king of courage it's going to be an awesome time we're going to have a great time together Thank you tonight for being here. I need to meet with all the team leaders. If you're a team leader, uh, I need to get with you tonight before you go. Um, <clears throat> just right over here to my right and your left. It won't take us too long, but I want to chat with you about just a couple things to make sure we're on board um, for some upcoming events that's, uh, that's about to be taking place. God bless you. We love you so much. Please keep up with us at theharborworshipcenter.org. And uh, there's all kinds of links that you can hook up from there. God bless you is my prayer, and we will see you on Wednesday night. Our guest, thank you so much for being here with us tonight. God bless you.